And we are live. Hello and welcome to episode three of I Will Not Quit. I am your host, Connor Byrne, and today I am your guest. That's right. Good to have a nice little conversation together. Um, I feel or felt as though if I'm going to be interviewing people and asking them hard questions or asking about why they failed or how they failed or how they got past it, um, that I should maybe give my viewing audience some perspective, kind of help you understand who I am, what I do, and yeah, just I, I would love for you all to understand me better and to get to know me better. I think that's a great way to build a relationship, just like any. So first off, I want to say, whoa, like how did we get to three? How did we get to episode three already? Like, I feel like I know for people that are watching three episodes is not a lot, but when you think about how somebody was so afraid to start a podcast, I was so afraid to, you know, kind of put myself out there that I didn't ever think about um, actually making it this far, maybe. I, I always thought about like the next step ahead and that's it. Um, so to get here is really awesome for me and I really appreciate whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you are. Um, thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for following me. Um, it means literally everything to me because if it weren't for you, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this. So I really appreciate you. And I think this is the best way to start by saying, who the hell am I? Well, let's just start from the beginning. So uh, my name is Connor Byrne. I am from Wald Lake, Michigan. That is about 45 minutes directly west of Detroit. I live right by a mall called 12 Oaks Mall. Uh, and and I'm kind of just this... <laughs> Like rambunctious human is probably the only way I would describe myself. Perhaps not what others would say about me, but I just consider myself somebody who sees and does. And that's just who I've been my entire life. My entire life, I have just been somebody that's got up, moved, and done something. So my passions, the things that I love to do, um, are, two, are two-sided. So one side is super creative and one is athletically driven. So... My major passions are soccer. I played soccer for 15 years. I played club soccer, and I loved every second of it. Playing club soccer teaches you about teamwork. It teaches you about individual efforts. It teaches you so many things that you don't even know you're learning until even now, like, you know, six, seven years detracted from the club side of the sport. Soccer did everything for me. So soccer shaped how I view leadership. Soccer shaped how I build teams. And soccer is just a great sport. If you've never played it, play it. If you do play it, keep playing it. Because I don't play it enough and I miss it every day. Now, something that I now do uh, post-college is running and triathlon. So I never did triathlon my entire life. I thought it was some crazy feat. I never thought I'd even get as far as to say I trained for uh, an official race, but I did. So triathlon is something that's really important to me because endurance sports in general just have so many teachings, so many disciplines, so many things for us to learn through the process of suffering. Endurance sports really just play such an integral part in how I view myself, how I value my time and my energy, how I push myself, whether it's uh, athletically or professionally. I just, I love everything to do with endurance sports. I think endurance sports just bring out the best in me, and that's why I do them. And now the opposite side of athleticism is what I love to do professionally, which is design. I think the best way to describe myself is designer, not because I'm an artist. A lot of people believe that being an artist is being a designer. Two completely different things. Being an artist is like Pablo Picasso 
coming up with some really amazing artwork that people really loved and that, you know, had so much impact, but being a designer's like Dieter Rams, like less is more, find simplicity. Being a designer is essentially a short word for being a creative problem solver. And from the moment that I was conscious and I understood that I was alive, I have always involved myself in the process of creating creative solutions. And I just, I thrive in coming up with a plan. I love coming up with solutions to things. I love solving problems. I love a start and an end. And I love being the person that can kind of fill in the gaps in the middle. So that is what I love to do. And that's just how I would describe myself and what I do. That's just, I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. And when you take those two things uh, together, one question that I asked myself was, um, what's important to me? And something that always comes to mind whenever I say something is important to me is the value of my time is valuable. And I've always known this from the day that I could realize it is that like my time is so valuable and I will literally give it to anybody that deserves it. But my time is valuable enough that everything that I do has a purpose and purpose is probably a word that I'll use the most when describing what I do day to day. It's just, it's purposeful. There's a general direction that I like to go and activities that I do day to day support a main goal. I'm super goal driven and I just, I love getting from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. If we can form a plan to get there, that's the way I want to do it. So with that being said, uh, my overall goal for the world, something that's important to me, um, that's not a selfish, like intrinsic goal, something that's extrinsic, something that um, I want to give back to others is this idea that I want to help people realize their true potential. As a leader, I want to be somebody that can help develop um, just this idea that everybody has this such, like just incredible potential in them. Humans are absolutely amazing people, amazing things, amazing creatures. We, ah, I could just go on forever about how amazing human beings are. There, there, you know, there's bad people and there's good people, but I'm just like this Labrador retriever that just loves everybody. <laughs> I think people just have so much to give the world. And I want to help people do a better job at that. I love showing people how they could realize their true potential. Now, I wasn't this outwardly optimistic about people, other people, and other things for as long as I've probably between the ages of 13 and now, I've just been such a critical person. And as uplifting as I might sound, my internal dialogue and the way that I viewed myself for so long and to this day view myself um, subconsciously is so critical. I can be my best friend and my worst enemy. And I actually love that. It sucks, but like, I love that. And it's kind of the inspiration for how I view this chapter of my life and content creation and providing um, a source of entertainment for other people is I came up with this name for my Instagram handle and I kind of just wanted to give it, give a title to myself if I were to give a title to myself. And I just called myself a professional failure. And at first I thought it was super downer. I thought maybe people wouldn't get it, but the longer that I use it, the more I come to terms with it and it it's valuable to me. So you might be asking, what the hell is a professional failure? And you could take the two words at face value. Um, you know, being a professional failure is just taking failure and being really good at it, um, making a living off of it. That's a professional is, you know, making, being uh, kind of the highest level of any sport is a professional. Um, and being a failure is just somebody who is really good at um, not being successful. Now, put the two together, and I think you 
create an excessively successful person. Exp- like, like, let me describe. So in order for me to describe being a professional failure, I kind of have to go back. I have to give you this scope, this uh, description. I have to detail you on how I came up with this name for myself. And I think it's important because it describes everything that I'm doing now. So essentially, two years ago or was it? It was like a year ago. So uh, it would be August, uh, no, May of 2019. May of 2019, I graduated college. Graduated from Central Michigan University with a degree in broadcasting with a minor in business, communications, and marketing. That's just a fancy way of saying like, I made it. I got through there. I got the piece of paper. I was done. So I was uh, living on my own. Not on my own, but I was living on my own with my girlfriend at the time in Ann Arbor, one of the more expensive cities in Michigan, but one of the best cities in the nation. And I was sitting in my apartment one day and I just, I was took in just who I was. I, I was trying to understand like what the hell was going on because I had just finished school. I didn't really know what I stood for. I didn't know who I was really. Um, and to really describe myself, uh, in a picture is just imagine this kid on a low, like a low rising, like memory foam mattress with a gray comforter over the top. And then just some, you know, 20 something year old kid. I looked very insignificant in the sense that, you know, I just had a kind of an overgrown beard, a little overweight, not in this, not in a fat, like a overly overt, like overtly fat sense. I just, I was just one of those guys that I looked like a, like a college drinker type of guy. I had the body type. I had the demeanor. I had kind of that look in your eye when you're like, you know, who is this guy? And I looked at you and when you looked at me a year ago or a year and a half ago, whatever it was, when you look back and you looked into my eyes, you just saw a guy who just looked absolutely defeated. And there were a lot of things to kind of pinpoint um, why I looked like that. Objectively, I was a broken human. I was somebody who, beyond anybody's fault but mine, like it was my own fault that I was the way I was. And I ch- made so many choices that ultimately kind of set me on this one path for myself. It wasn't a definitive path, but it was a path of just like sad, man. I was depressed. I was overweight and I was so depressed. I'm, I mean, like everybody gets a little bit of depression in their life potentially, but I mean like everything, my inner critic was me and there was no optimist. It was just me being self-defeatist and not even giving myself a chance. So something that contributed to this was my relationship with other people. I think behind any defeated man are many defeated, uh, burned relationships. And I happen to be the one burning bridges left and right for no reason other than because I was in a what we call in today's society, a toxic relationship. Toxic relationships are a good blanket term for things, but like toxic as a word is kind of a blanket term. But in the scope of this this relationship, it was toxic. I mean, just like wherever you looked, whenever you looked at me and my partner, there was just no respect There was no respect for time. Nobody valued each other the way they should have. Being in a toxic relationship is not a one-way street, no matter what you say. Being in a toxic relationship is a two-way street. It takes one toxic person and another person who's willing to accept the toxicity, which in turn makes them a toxic person objective, completely objective. This is nothing on anybody that has a uh, relationship that they would consider toxic. 
just objectively, this is how bad relationships happen. You have one person who doesn't know what they deserve. You have one person who doesn't value themselves highly. And you have another person who's able to talk loud enough to speak over this person, this other person's conscious. You have one person who has, like, who calls all the shots, and then you have another person who's the codependent. And I was a codependent. And I didn't know that somebody could be codependent. I just thought I was just this normal person who just happened to be in some bad circumstances. But hell no. I was in neck deep in uh, a relationship that really did me no favors. But I chose not to walk away at any time. I had multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities to walk away. and never did. And the reason I'm describing this in detail is because there was one day that I did. I walked away. And it wasn't a conscious decision. It was just impulsive. I had to walk away. It's kind of like when you have a tumor. It's just you just kind of have to just rip the bandaid off. You just have to rip something out. And essentially, I... Uh, I, w- I remember the day that I went on my first run while I was alone at the apartment in an arbor. And I remember I went on this run. It was just a short run. But I was at the time um, recovering from vaping. I was recovering. I was still drinking pretty heavily. Um, and in general, I just I had not f- taken care of myself physically in months. So I went on this first run. I remember I came back and I took a picture of myself in the mirror and it's super blurry, but I just, I remember looking at myself and being like, I know there's something inside of this vessel of mine that, um, the outside of my vessel is not reflecting. And I didn't know how to get back to that. I didn't know how to get back to the kid who was super confident in playing soccer in high school. I didn't know how to get back to this person who can make a decision and run with it and roll with the punches. I knew that person was inside of me, but that was not the person I was. So, uh, worst came to worst, and one day, I just, I just remember waking up on my parents' couch. End of May, it only took me one month of living in the same studio apartment with my other partner at the time. It took me a month, and within the month, I went from moving in to moving out. But I I remember distinctly, it was the end of May, I woke up on my parents' couch, my mom was washing the dishes, my dad was making breakfast, and I just said, how the hell did I get here? I just, I I remember in a drunken flurry, I, I hopped in my dad's car in the middle of the night after I called him after a bad night at the bar, and he drove me home, took me away, and that was it. And that was the beginning of this journey of becoming a professional failure. failure. And I never used that term with myself uh, before. But that was the first time that I said, like, you know what? Maybe I failed. Maybe I really failed. And I just didn't know what to, to do with that word. I was like, well, how could I be a failure? Like, I never failed at something. I never really failed so hard that everybody was like it was on display for everybody. But I I had failed many people. I had failed people that had given me their time, their money, their energy. I had failed them. And I had failed myself by allowing myself to get to this point. So I get off my parents' couch and I just start trying to figure out what the hell is going on. So I signed up for a gym and uh, I started my new job, which I still have to this day. And... I essentially just started going through the motions if there was ever a way of kind of putting that out there. I just I started going through the motions. Things in my life at that time were so fragile still. I, I didn't know if I was going to be living in at my parents' home. I didn't know how long they were going to let me stay. I didn't know what I was going to do with all my stuff that was in the apartment where my then partner was living. And everything was just up in the air. Everything was still shaky. 
but I knew that if I committed to one thing that perhaps something else would come from it. So yeah, essentially I started doing, uh, combat sports at, at the gym. So my job would be from four in the afternoon until one in the morning. I would get out of work at one clock out. And then my gym was no more than a three minute drive away. It was a 24 hour gym. There was no personnel there. I could just go there and I could just do my thing. Whatever it was, whatever called me that day, I could do that thing. So I got into combat sport. I started learning how to kickbox. I was watching YouTubes on how to punch, kickbox, or kick, punch, kick, um, and just really, try, you know, not how to defend myself, but like I just, I fell in love with the UFC. I fell in love with these people, these fighters, because fighters stand up for what they believe in. They fight for themselves, like at the core of it, they fight for themselves and their team and nobody else. And they are fearless about it. They just, all they do is fight, fight, fight as hard as they can. And that's just so respectful, like respectable of a person is to just fight for what you believe in. So I said, you know what, maybe that's something that I need to get involved with. So after about a couple months of getting into combat sport, two months, uh, I finally had to get the rest of the stuff out of my apartment uh, that was in Ann Arbor. And as I was getting it all out, I just realized just within the scope of two months, that I had gone from this fat, lazy, depressed individual into somebody who kind of knew what it was to fight for something. I had actually begun to learn the value of self-acceptance and being able to stand up for myself. And so at the end of those two months, I just really got a lot of perspective. And I began to learn how to forgive myself and how to forgive people who'd done me wrong. I said that a toxic relationship is two parties, two toxic parties essentially. And that is where I drew the line. I said, I have absolutely no ill will to this other person. I have nothing. I actually have nothing, like I have nothing to say about the other person to this day. I, I, all I have is some things happen and I didn't like how those things happen, so I stopped. Objectively, I have nothing, you know, bad or good to say about the person. I just said, you know what, I'm done, and um, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do things my own way. And so from the day that I was able to actually get back my own personal belongings, which was about a year ago to this day, pretty, you know, approximation, but... So within this year, I really understood the value of failing and learning from it because I had failed before, but I didn't realize how bad I had failed. But uh, a few years prior, um, I had also failed. I had, you know, I got fired from a job and I didn't realize how bad I had failed. But this failure in particular, because it blew up on so many other people, I realized that was a failure for once in my life. I realized that I'm really good at failing big. Like I can fail just on an absolutely enormous scale. And I, I genuinely thought it was imp impressive. Like I don't think anybody could really fail as bad as I could. And I know there are people that can out there that can fail worse than I can. Not that I would wish that upon them, but I just knew like, wow, like I've, you know what? I, I'm pretty good at failing. You know, like this is, I could, I could be professional at this. So I called myself the, the professional failure and it was a really good piece of self-acceptance for myself. It's like, well, I went through five years of college. I didn't really like 99% of what I did. So I failed. So what? I just did it. I failed. I came, I went, or I came, I failed, I went. And that's it. No problem. Nobody cares. And I tried to live on my own with a partner and I failed. No problem. Nobody cares. And, you know, I've, I had I had so many expectations for myself, I think. I had held such a high ceiling over myself that um, I never gave myself the breath or the air to actually forgive myself. And so I really learned the art of forgiveness. And 
something that led me to where I am today is when I finally said like, you know what? I just need to like, I need to learn how to suffer as much as possible and to deal with it. So one day I just went for a long run. I think I went for like six mile run. I'd never run past six miles. I'd always played soccer for hours, but I never like done a definitive like six mile run. So I did a six mile run and it sucked and my legs hurt for days afterwards. But I just said like, you know what? Like that was the first time my head was clear, like just so effortlessly clear. So I said, you know what? The craziest thing that I've seen on YouTube is people doing a triathlon, an Ironman tri triathlon, where they do a 2.4 mile swim, 2.4 mile swim, 121 mile bike, or 122, whatever it is, 122 mile bike, and uh, a marathon. And I just said like, you know, that's, that's crazy. But half marathon, not so bad. So I signed up for the Michigan Titanium, which was supposed to happen this past weekend. But I signed up six months before. So I signed up in December of 2019. And yeah, just I started from square one, which was just try to get your cardio up. And I, so I self-coached myself all the way uh, through learning how to be a triathlete. I never learned, I had never known how to swim my entire life. And I had never gone, I had never even run a half marathon in my life. And I really didn't even own a bike. I had my dad's road bike. But on the whole, I just said like, you know what, if I can put my mind to this, I will do it. So I signed up. And what came next was six months of absolute bliss. Just six months of sucking. But while I was suffering and sucking, I just felt so joyful. I felt so good. And I knew that this was something that other people, something that I wanted to share with other people. So I started really posting and, and building on social media. And I realized that this idea that we can push past any mental barrier that we impose on ourselves this idea that um, we are capable of achieving you know three four five times as much as we actually believe we can achieve is true we can achieve exceptional things if we put our mind to them so I just wanted to keep I wanted to keep sharing that message and I wanted to share that message in a way that people could relate to which is you know what I'm not going to be perfect every day I'm not going to be able to be this you know Iron Man every day. Some days I'm going to be vulnerable. Some days I'm just going to not be feeling good. And I just knew that people were going to resonate with that. I knew people deep down inside, like there's a lot of people out there that have things they will always internalize and they'll never tell people publicly, um, but things that really hurt them, things that really, hmm, Things that, you know, they're demons. Like, people will never share their demons. But for me, it was like, I had to get it out. And I had to get it out through running. I had to get it out through biking. I had to get it out through just the utmost level of suffering. For me, my therapy was suffering. And I know for a lot of people, like, oh, just go see a therapist. Uh, go, you know, get help somewhere. But no, not at all. Not for me. It just, I needed, I needed to get out my inner demons. And the only way I saw fit was not to talk, but to run, to suffer. And that has been my therapy for six months. And now within the scope of this conversation over the course of one year, I think I'm on the path to becoming somebody that I'm willing to be happy for, somebody that um, I can actually confide in. Like deep down inside, I, I know who I am and I know that uh, I am worth something, that I am truly capable of 
love and loving. I'm capable of sharing with other people. I'm capable of being selfless. Just this idea that truly, like, the word love is not something that a year ago I would ever apply to myself. I, I think even since the age of 13, I have not once been able to say I love myself. And it, it's been for a myriad of reasons, but really it's because I've never given myself the chance at all. And that day that I woke up on my parents' couch, I said, you know, how did I get here? How did, but how am I so lucky? How am I so lucky that no matter what, if I fail, that there are people around me that are willing to pick me back up? And from that day, I just knew that I needed to start building a community of people that resonated with that concept. So there are people to this day that, whether it's on social media or in person, that there are people out there that recognize that I am suffering, not ov just overtly through workouts, but I, I suffer mentally every day. I overthink about everything. I'm so critical and I'm always trying to be the best. I'm always trying to be a perfectionist. And people know that that's a valid thing. And they know and I now now through sharing, I know that other people understand how my brain works just a little bit. Um it's a full time job from the moment that I wake up at eight thirty in the morning till the moment that I go to bed at like 1 a.m. that taking care of myself is a full-time job. Taking care of how my mind works is a full-time job. And I knew that through failure, that at some point, if I failed enough, I could be successful at something. And I don't know what that thing is going to be yet. You know what? On my resume, I might be a newspaper designer, but deep down inside, I know I am absolutely, unequivocally a professional at failing and getting back up. That no matter what, no matter how many times life pushes me down, that I'm getting back up. Because calling out defeat by... Raising the white flag, that's essentially me saying, like, I don't love myself enough or I'm not willing to give myself enough time to accomplish something. That every day that I fail, it's just an opportunity for me to get back up. And that's something that, that propels me and pushes me every day now is that I am await, I await for the moment that I fail at something. And I, I almost, I, I throw myself at things that I'm, that I'm going to fail at. The inner perfectionist in me every day is going to find something that I fail at. So I roll with it. I, I, I look for it. And that's why now going into, uh, this, you know, triathlon training, the world has stopped train. The world has stopped uh, hosting events or let me put it better. I trained for a half or a half Ironman triathlon for six months, perhaps like maybe nine, if you count the months up to that. So let's say in nine months, I trained for an, a half Ironman triathlon. And within the last month, it was canceled. No more done. There's a virtual event, but if I chose to do the virtual event, it would mean I would have to forfeit my entry fee, which was hundreds of dollars, forfeit my entry fee for 2021. Instead, I had to do, and I could do, you know, I could use my entry fee to do the virtual event. And I was like, no, like I'd rather use it for the 2021 event than to do something virtual where like I'm not there with, with, with the people that I love that um, are cheering me on 
from either side of that, you know, kind of lane with the red carpet. I just knew it wasn't right. I, I couldn't stop there. So I, the moment that it was can't, this race was canceled, I said, I knew this was coming. So I wasn't surprised. I wasn't mad. I wasn't angry. I just kind of said like, all right, so it's done. Look where we got. In nine months, I went from fat, lazy alcoholic to somebody who gives a damn. And that's all that matters to me. And we're going to keep moving forward with that. So getting past kind of those heavier things, the reasons why I chose to get into endurance sports, the reason I chose to, um, you know, invest in myself, moving past that, I really want to emphasize that I'm looking at each day and each day only. I, and I only look ahead maybe a day. But the process of building a goal is about kind of viewing what you'll look like, you know, at the end of any set goal. So I've set some goals for myself uh, going into the next six months of my life. And one of those, and a couple of those are going to be a five minute mile. I'm going to run a three hour and 15 minute marathon on Christmas. And I'm going to run and complete the Michigan Titanium in 2021. So I'm really stoked about what is to come in the future. But right now I'm so grateful. I think a word for for how I feel is just absolutely grateful for the opportunities that have been afforded to me. Not by, just of my own grit and sweat and blood and tears, but because everybody around me, everybody that lives in my neighborhood sees that I suffer and they've helped me. Everybody that is friends with me has shown me some love. They have shown me support, even if it's just a small iota, like, you know, just saying, just asking about my day or asking about my training, like it means the world to me. And I understand now the value of building a tribe of just beautifully committed friends. We can't change who our friends are. We can't change um, our relationships overnight. It takes hard work. It takes dedication. It takes good communication. So outside of my professional efforts, six months from now, I envision myself as somebody who can communicate better with others, somebody who can build strong, meaningful relationships with other people, and somebody who can unite uh, individuals that wouldn't necessarily have ever crossed paths. I want to really try and help other people find people that can support each other. That's so important to me is to build a tribe. Because as tribes, humans for th you know thousands of years, we have built tribes because it makes us more efficient and it keeps us safe and it makes us better as people. We learn new things from people. We learn new perspectives. We see how people do certain things and we can learn. And that is why I want to be professional failure for the time being is because the failure is not how I define myself. It's I define my failures by what I've learned. And Every time that I have an opportunity to fail, I view it as an opportunity to learn. And that's really all that matters to me, is learning. I am just on a quest to learn as much as possible because it's important to me. It's important to me to understand other people. It's important to me to understand how the world works and how, as a designer, as a creative problem solver, I can create solutions. And that's just, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. And I don't know what I will look like a year from now, a six months from now. But I know that if I just put my head down every day, if I just look at what I need to do, I just need to stop thinking about it and just do it. Let that inner perfectionist sing but understand that I don't give a damn. Like my inner perfectionist will tell me this isn't 
you know, colorful enough, or this isn't straight enough, or this isn't high quality enough, or this shot is bad, or this video is bad, or this design doesn't, um, incorporate, uh, or it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, match what I envisioned. Who cares? That's just one fake voice in my head. And I know there's a lot of people with that voice in their head. And it's important to know that that inner critic is just there, but it doesn't have to call the shots. For me, I'm just going to get up every day and I'm going to stop thinking about the little details. I'm just going to look at the big picture and be like, where do I want to go? Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be with? What do I want to do? And once I get that big picture, the day-to-day is easy. The day-to-day is just like, well, let's, you know, let's just do this thing. Let's figure it out later. You know, let's make a mess now, clean it up later. But like when we clean it up, like we'll have something new there. So yeah, that's just like, that's, that's how I see the next six months. I'm going to be a better marathon runner. I'm going to run a marathon and I hope along the way I can help build a tribe of people that share in the vision of being stronger as humans, humans that want to be better for themselves and for others. Because in 2020, we felt, I think there's, there's a, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of, there's a lot going on. And as much as I try my best to keep my content and my person rooted in the day to day and rooted in what I have to accomplish and rooted in what other people are accomplishing at some point, you know, we live in a world that has a lot going on. There's, there's so much happening in this world um, that sometimes it can be really hard to handle, really hard to comprehend, or just really hard to um, take it all in. And I think it's important that we keep, we lift ourselves up, we keep each other accountable, and we push ourselves to become better than we were the day before. And that's why I did this podcast. That's why I created this podcast. That's why... I want to start producing more content for other people because I'm not looking at this monetarily at all. I am strictly looking at this as how many people can we get on this bandwagon? How many people can we, can we put uh, on this bandwagon and say like, you know what, let you, we got a, we got a tribe of really strong willed individuals here. And I think these people could change the world. I think it's totally feasible. I think it's totally possible. I think it's something the world deserves is stronger, happier people. Makes the world a better place. So that is the story of me. That is the story of the professional failure Instagram handle. And that is the reason why I built this podcast is because the world deserves to hear good stories. The world deserves to hear new perspectives. The world deserves to hear how you failed and how you got back up. Because how we get back is get get back up is how we define ourselves as people. So yeah. I just really appreciate if uh y'all have made it through the end of this podcast. You know, what is something that you can do for yourself? And then what is one thing that you can do for others in your day to day? How can you make the world a better place? How can you leave it uh, better than you than you encountered it? That's what I ask of you. And if you can come up with an answer for that, keep following. Keep sharing and keep building because that is what is going to change the world. Individual efforts will change the world. So keep failing, keep learning. And keep doing your thing because you deserve it. You deserve, you deserve to love yourself and to love others. So yeah, thanks for hanging out with me. I am your host, Connor. Until, no, until next Wednesday, I bid you adieu.